introducing our leader, the next premier of, of Ontario, Andrea Horvath. And this election is really all about what comes next for Ontario, right? Our leader, Ontario's next premier, Doug Ford. I've never seen a province unite behind a cause of turning this province around like I've seen this election. The Premier of Ontario and the leader of our party, Kathleen Wynne. You know, this is a very important election. We are literally, as a province, deciding on what the future of this province is going to look like. We've lost tens of thousands of jobs, but there's still lots of improvement to be done. The team that would probably do the best for the province should win. We're a have-not province now. The economy's changing. I mean, Glenn and Brian and Tay know that. Shane knows that. Everyone standing behind me knows that. These are people who live in the North. They know that it's changing. I remember thinking that government didn't care about me. They didn't care about me or my family. They didn't care about your families. It, it's not the sexy thing to talk about infrastructure, and, and but those are the things that we're investing in. What makes us Canadian, what makes us Ontarian, is care is based on needs, not an ability to pay. Uh, my, mine is about trying to create jobs and uh, make a better life for people in Sudbury. Our plans mean more money in the hands of folks in the north working hard to dig those mines and to build those roads. Thanks, everybody. Merci. Friends, I want to thank you. I can't wait to come back. And I just want to say we appreciate your support, your vote. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Sudbury.com's election night coverage. Ontario Votes 2018, folks, it's been a watershed election. I'm Mark Gentili, the uh, managing editor of Sudbury.com and Northern Life. Thank you for joining us on this special election night coverage. We're about half an hour out from when the polls close. We're going to be having all those results for you uh, coming up shortly. Uh, but in the meantime, we have a plan to keep you engaged, keep you informed. Uh, throughout this process, we're going to be with you all night. We've got analysis, we've got commentary, we've got interviews with former cabinet ministers reacting to the race and to the parties and to the issues. Uh, and if you take a note up here in the top corner of the screen, you'll notice uh, the color-coded bars. Keep an eye on those numbers, or keep an eye on those, because in about half an hour, those are going to be filling up with poll numbers from Sudbury and from Nickel Belt. Uh, tonight we're going to be uh, welcoming Nick Liard from uh, KISS 105.3 and 92.7 Rocks. He's going to be uh, coming on and joining me a little bit later on. He's going to be bringing us analysis. He's going to bring, be bringing us some Twitter numbers. He's going to be have, have some commentary uh, as well as some comments and, and all that sort of good stuff. Um, uh, as well, uh, we will shortly be going to an interview that I did uh, a short time ago with Darren McDonald. If you don't know Darren, uh, Darren is our political affairs and our city hall reporter here at Sudbury.com. He is one of the, if actually not one of, he is the most experienced journalist we have in Sudbury working today and we are very lucky to have him working here at Sudbury.com for you. He's going to be joining me uh, for an interview a little bit later, uh, just in a couple of minutes actually, uh, and we're going to talk about the race, we're going to talk about uh, the, uh, the issues, and we're going to get uh, a little bit of Darren's experience uh, you know, bring Darren's experience to bear on uh, what is shaping up to be a watershed election in Ontario. Um, so, remember, uh, we are live here, so you can tweet us on Twitter at Sudbury.com, you can comment on Facebook, you can comment on Sudbury.com, our website, and you can also comment if you're watching on our YouTube page. We're going to be gathering those comments and uh, we will be reading them back to you a little bit later. But right now, let's go to my little, uh, to a little a conversation that I had a short time ago with Darren McDonald. We haven't seen an election like this in Ontario in 15 years, probably. I mean, um, you know, we've seen the the ascendancy of the N of the NDP. Uh, people are actually looking at the party, you know, as a maybe I can vote for them to be. Uh, you know, our government for the first time since, since 1990. And it won't even be accidental in a way like it was in 1990. Uh, the Conservative Party is not, today, is not the same Conservative Party that we had six months ago under Patrick Brown. And maybe the biggest thing about this is, is we've seen liberal support just collapse 
Yeah, it, it, it's shocking in a lot of ways because normally when voters get tired of governments is because the economy is bad, is because there's you know um, something really wrong. This is unique in that unemployment is at 5.5 percent. Um, you know, the books aren't balanced, but they've introdu introduced a lot of very popular programs. And even their campaign uh, strategy is uh, full of, you know, promises that normally would uh, at least entice voters. Yeah. Uh, there's a term I like to use, it's called the toast is burnt, and it, it seems the, uh, the Liberals' toast definitely is burnt this time. Yeah. Um, no matter what they say, what they promise, they just can't seem to get any traction with voters. Uh, it's, it, and even in Sudbury, um, you know, it's expected that the New Democrats will win even though uh, you know, the Liberals couldn't have showered more um, funding yeah. and support for this area you know, if they tried. Yeah. Sudbury, Nickel Belt, we've done quite well uh, under the last 15 years of, uh, of liberal, liberal rule. So for Sudbury in particular, um, this is a pretty big election. It is, and um, history tells us that it's, it's very important to this riding who wins. I guess starting from 1990 when uh, the Bob Ray, New, New Democrat uh, government under Bob Ray was elected, we had Shelley Martell, we had Floyd Logren, as well as Sharon Murdoch, but Shelley and Floyd were in cabinet. And they were pretty powerful, and that's when the uh, Ministry of Northern Development and Mines moved from Toronto to Sudbury. Um, it, we've got a lot of investment at that time. Mm -hmm. Under Mike Harris, once the New, New Democrats were tossed out, well, Mike Harris was the MPP for North Bay. All of a sudden, and, and people who were around in the 90s will remember, yeah. any kind of investment that they could possibly make in North Bay went to North Bay. Uh, they moved the mental health hospital out of Sudbury into North Bay. And you know we suffered for a long time until 2003, Dalton McGinty, Rick Bartolucci. You know, it was pretty much 11 years of you know, uh, government largesse coming to... Yeah. yeah, I mean, the major parties seem to have made New, the New Democrats and the Liberals especially, Sudbury had priority. They, it was a writing they wanted to keep. Yeah. Um, so what does that mean for June 7th? If we see a uh, New Democrat government, obviously Franz Jelena is going to be a cabinet minister in an Andrew Horvath government, possibly health minister, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly a high profile. Uh, you know, Glenn Thibault was energy minister, you know, Franz will probably have something. As the longtime health critic and yeah. Yeah, you would expect. So we should be okay. Um, if the Tories win, Vic Fideli will be a very big, possibly finance minister in a Doug. Oh yeah, he'll be, he's sure he will be a player. He will be a significant minister. Um, you don't want to be cynical and think, oh well, you know, Doug, Doug and uh, Vic would just, you know, send everything to North Bay. But it, you know, given our history, it's, it's difficult to, uh, certainly easy to be worried. Sudbury has been a Tory wasteland since Jim Gordon in the 80s. Sudbury is not a uh, hard right-wing town by and large. We have a long union history. Uh, we have a lot of civil servants here. Yeah. You know, uh, that's one of our bigger industries is uh, you know public service. So when a cost-cutting government is elected, mm -hmm. you know one that's likely to downsize the civil service in some point. You know, uh, even though they're not saying that, uh, that's bad news for Sudbury. Yeah. One of the bigger implications, I think, for a Tory government, particularly a majority government. Yeah is the question of uh, completing the four laning of Highway 69. That's been a huge issue for the North um, you know, for decades. Mm -hmm. The uh, New Democrats in 2014 promised to finish it faster than the Liberals. Uh, the Liberals, you know, no one's happy with the pace, but they have made substantial progress. I think there's 70 kilometers left, yeah, something great. like that. Um, but it was interesting to me at the uh, Greater Sudbury Chamber of Commerce debate, Troy Crowder was asked about what a, a Doug Ford government would do in Highway 69, and I thought his answer, answer was quite interesting. Okay, let's watch that. As a northerner, I would love to see the four lane finished. The sooner the better. Uh, but obviously we also have to realize that with the thousands and tens of thousands of jobs that have been left, uh, job creation and stimulus comes in infrastructure and it also comes in new technologies. So uh, Doug's plan, I'm sure, will be to balance out the both of those and try to move our profits forward as quickly as we can to make it a healthier economy for everybody. What do you make of that? I didn't hear an answer. Um, I, it doesn't sound like Doug Ford is uh, going to make that a priority, yeah. uh, which would be huge news around here. Uh, you know, finishing the four laning, you know, opens up all kinds of economic opportunity. Um, you know, for the film industry, it's huge because we get a lot of people coming in from Toronto. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's really a lifeblood for the, for the long-term future of Sudbury and if, um, 
the Tories are elected, you know, would they? It would be love to, we would love to hear whether or not it would be a priority for them. Listening to that answer, it, it doesn't sound like it is. Yeah. Um, what about the minority majority situation? How do you see that sort of playing out for Sudbury? I think there is a possibility that it could be a minority government. In that case, um, it really depends on if there's a coalition. If um, It's difficult to see at this point a Doug Ford government in a coalition with either the Liberals or the New Democrats. It would be, pretty t it would be really surprising. Yeah, um, but the Liberals and the New Democrats have a history of working together, you know, um, in the 90s, you know, before Bob Ray was elected, there was a, a deal with David Peterson. Um, you know, Andrew Horvath propped up briefly the Kathleen Wynne government. So if, if that's the situation, you know, Sudbury might, uh, might be okay. But in that situation, again, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a Tory minority government, that could be quite problematic for the next four years. I mean, the, the, uh, the Liberals and the New Democrats, you know, could, could make life difficult for them. It's difficult to see a scenario where a progressive conservative minority government lasts four years. Yeah. I, I just, not, I'm not sure where they, get the, they would get their support, and I'm not sure what benefit it would be to the, either the Liberals or the New Democrats to cooperate with a, a Doug Ford government. Yeah. And, and looking at, at the way the polls are going, I mean, one day, you know, the Tories are on top, the next day the New Democrats are on top, next one day it's going to be a NDP majority, another day it's going to be, you know, Doug Ford, Andrea is going to win the popular vote, but Doug Ford is, is going to win a majority government anyway. I mean, it, we can't even and tell what's going on. The, the Tories have a much easier path to a majority government than, than the, the Democrats because of the way the vote split and there's yeah. just writings where you know the, the Democrats aren't competitive because you know for demographic reasons they're splitting with the Liberals or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's difficult to see a New Democrat majority but you never know. Yeah. Best case scenario for Sudbury what do you think? A New Democrat majority. A new Democrat majority would be the best case for Sudbury? If we're just being self-interested, yes. Yeah. You know, even though there was a terrible recession going on in the early 90s, Sudbury did okay. Yeah. What about for Ontario? What do you think is the best case scenario for Ontario? That's a different question. I, I think a minority government, certainly. Yeah. One that isn't in power for a long time and maybe the parties are a little bit chastened and come back yeah. with more realistic platforms. Sort of as we said in, in Northern Life, Sudbury.com said in our editorial, uh, about how you know perhaps the best course of action is uh, is a minority on from either the New Democrats or or the Tories because it would kind of temper the uh, the, the, the 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 worst policies of either party. Yeah, and the wild card in all of this is you know whether it's the New Democrats, the Liberals, or the Tories, they're all basing their deficit and spending forecasts on <clears throat> the assumption that we're going to grow two percent every year for the next four years. Yeah. As we heard yesterday with the trade war that the Americans are starting, that's, you know, it, that turns out to be a long-term battle that's going to you know, affect economic growth on the continent and in Europe, yeah. including Ontario. And then all of a sudden, all those deficit forecasts are thrown out the window, and we could be in for uh, you know, significant problems. Yeah, I mean, it would be, a, you know, if uh, interest rates suddenly, uh, you know, if we're in the middle of a trade war and suddenly interest rates uh, go through the roof, I mean, then you're hit with a double whammy. Yeah, because in a trade war, the cost of goods tend to go up. We're an importing, exporting nation. So if costs are going up and simultaneously with the economy slowing down, that's, that, that's a potential disaster for government. Welcome back. I want to welcome uh, Nick Liard from uh, KISS 105.3 and 92.7 Rocks to the show. Thank you, Mark. Well, you know what we think about the election, but elections are about you, the people, the voters. And so we sent weekend reporter Gia Patil out into the streets to see, you know, which way you were leaning in this election and what election topics were the most important to you. So take it away, Gia. I'm Gia Patel and I'm with Sabri.com. Elections are just around the corner and we've heard from all the parties about issues that they think are important to people here in the north. I'm out and about in the community today and we're going to find out about some of the issues that are important to people here in Sudbury. What are some of the issues that you feel are important to people here in the north? The tuition, the prices for school is pretty expensive for students going into universities. We're always scared about going in debt. 
and hopefully like still getting a job after we're done our school because of the economy. For example, colleges are always guaranteed a job afterwards and the tuition is cheaper, but in university the tuition is way more expensive, the books are expensive, and we're not always guaranteed a job right after university. Change is always good, but at the same time a lot of it um, Personally, it doesn't affect me, so uh, it's biased and everything, it's just pure conservative all the way, 100%. Uh, for me, education is most important because I'm a teacher and my kids are obviously in the school system, so education is most important for me. Don't know who I'm voting for yet. Uh, don't know who the worst of the three evils are. We've seen what Wynn has done. and. Not too sure what Ford would do, and I don't know what Horvath, Horvath would do. Don't know where to go. Undecided, undecided. definitely. Generally, the kids, my, both our children, left the city to get jobs a number of years ago. So uh, things like that, and um, I'm just kind of afraid of what the other ones are promising and how they're going to pay for it. Nobody really seems to know. It seems like they're going to take from one purse and put it in another. So I'm just afraid things are going to go downhill. Social issues, uh, social housing, uh, food security, um, the environment, uh, the concern for community, the uh, need to get away from greed and to move into community and ensuring that people, and this is very broad, people have a decent source of income and that they have enough at the end of the day to be able to eat well and clothe themselves. The very basic needs that we feel or I feel are denied a lot of people because of circumstances that are seem to be beyond the, their, their control. What I care most about in this election is the um is spending on public services and I don't think we've ever recovered from the Mike Harris Day cuts. The Liberals did you know restore some some of that the funding that was cut to health care, education, social social services and uh, and I really hope that we can uh, restore uh, even 20 years later the the funding that existed to those sectors uh, and and uh, and I also hope that uh, the government has the guts to actually raise taxes to to fund those things and I say that because it's well documented uh, that uh, taxes both corp corporate and personal uh, income taxes are quite low in this province uh, but it's a huge myth that uh, that we're overtaxed so I hope we can uh, like I said again restore what we used to have uh, pre Mike Harris this election is outrageous. You are almost at the point of damned if you do and damned if you don't, but you have to vote. So you're hoping that you're doing the right thing and getting the right people to do the right job. And uh, that's all you can do. Welcome back. KISS 105.3 and 92.7 Rock. Uh, we're about five minutes out from uh, the closing of the polls. Um, and you're watching the uh, live stream coverage of uh, election 2018 here in Sudbury, brought to you by College Boreal. Now, as you just, we just watched a series of streeters, and if you just noticed at the end there, uh, the woman uh, uh, sort of ends off with the, the, the message that, uh, you know, we're damned if we do, and we're damned if we don't this, uh, this election. And for the Liberals, uh, they may be, may be more damned than most, eh, Nick? Well, you know what, it's going to be a weird election because provincially the Liberals have been in power for quite some time. But that's also the case here in Sudbury. The Liberals have, have held this riding, Sudbury riding, since 1995 except for a five-month stretch when in 2014 Sudbury elected... Hold on to party status. So, you know, what will that mean for Glenn Tebow here in Sudbury and the rest of the candidates? Uh, I guess the only time we'll tell you is in five minutes, four minutes now, probably. Yeah, it's uh, and and because we have uh, a lot of electronic voting machines at play. In
in this election. We're actually expecting the results to, to come in much faster than they, uh, than they normally would with uh, the hand-counted ballots. They just, I, like, they took my ballot and just, it was yeah. gone. And I think it counted right there. That was... It's pretty cool. I, I thought it was pretty cool too. The uh, the little lady who moved, who uh, who was feeding the banners into the or feeding the ballots into the machine seemed yeah. very excited about the. Uh, oh, about she was the, super excited. Yeah. My yeah, my mine got, had a little trouble having it work, but you know what? I I, I voted. I got my time, and uh, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm not in a rush. This is fun. Actually, uh, speaking of uh, any troubles, if you did have uh, trouble with your electronic voting machine while you were out voting, uh, tweet at us, comment on Facebook. Uh, comment on uh, YouTube and, and let us know. Uh, we'd uh, we'd like to hear uh, what your experience was. Now, as we mentioned, this is uh, you know the, the the liberals are the the party that may suffer the most in this election, if uh, mm. if we can put it that way. And uh, I sat down with uh, Rick Bartolucci, uh, you know the man who was once known as the Minister of Sudbury, uh, last week to to talk about this race and this election and what has happened to his party. And let me tell you. Rick Bartolucci pulled no punches uh, when he uh, he had some tough criticism for for Kathleen Wynne, and uh, I think we're going to go to that interview uh, right now, and we'll be back. In a so the polls look like this will be a reckoning election for the Liberals after 15 years of um, you know pretty solid rule from the from the party. It looks like, given the polls, this might be the end for the Liberal Party for a little while. Is that, uh, is that how you're seeing things? Yeah, I, think, uh, I don't think every poll in the province of Ontario is wrong. Yeah. And if, in fact, that's the case, there's something wrong with pollsters. Yeah. The reality is, uh, I think Ontarians want change. And I think they're looking for change. Mm -hmm. And uh, that certainly isn't manifested uh, for the people of Ontario in the Liberal platform. How did the party get here? Like, how, I mean, what, this, you know, obviously being in power for a long period of time, you, you know, you drag a whole bunch of baggage with you and there's all that sort of stuff. But how did the party go from, you know, from a solid majority, you know, in the last election to, you know, clinging by their fingernails to party status potentially, um, you know, after the election on June 7th? If we're lucky, yeah, we'll have party status. The reality is uh, governments can last a long time. I don't believe... Uh, the, the idea that while well, they've been we've been in power for 15 years it's time for a change okay. if you have good policy if you have good opportunities that are well thought out mm -hmm. uh, governments can last for a long time right. Bill Davis is an example of what good government was and how long it lasted I believe under Dalton McGuinty we had very very good government we came, we had very very good policies but there was a leadership and in that leadership, there were two contestants mainly, one very much right of centre and Kathleen Wynne very much left of centre. Yeah. The party chose left of centre. In my estimation, it was a social experiment for liberalism that's failed. Why is that? Well, the reality is we're liberals. Yeah. We we're a centrist party. We're, we've always been a centrist party. The strength of Dalton McGuinty, the strength of David Peterson was that we remained in the center. We took that which was good from the right. Mm -hmm. We took that which was good from the left. And we developed good policy for the people of Ontario. We were not fixated on moving in only one direction. We always tried to find balance. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, and I think uh, I, I, you have to give uh, the leader uh, the, uh, the reasons to celebrate, but also the reasons to, f to cry. Right. And this is one election where I think we're going to be crying. And uh, so the reality is, she moved us too far left. Okay. And it became, one, cost prohibitive for the people of Ontario, certainly. And uh, it wasn't good policy. Right. And the people of Ontario, I think, will clearly say that over the course of the next election. Why do you think um, Kathleen Wynne moving the party, uh, as you say, so far to the left, why do you think, uh, in your estimation, are voters reacting negatively to that now? When they, in 2014, they, the, the, the electorate seemed to buy into that message from Kathleen Wynne. Uh, I think we have to bring the other party, uh, the progressive conservatives, into, into play here, because I think uh, they're the only political party I know that can snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. You, you go back to John Ter Tory, the religion, uh, religious school issue. Right? Lost the election on that. Tim Hudak, I mean Kathleen Wynne didn't win the last election. Tim Hudak lost 
the last election. I mean, with his crazy proposal to lay off 100,000 people in the province of Ontario. I mean, especially when we're just get coming out of a recession, we're trying to recover, we're trying to develop, we're trying to grow, and this guy says, I'm gonna cut 100,000 100, jobs from the people of Ontario. Guess what? That's how you lose an election. So you go back to uh, 2014 and you realize that Tim Hudak lost the election, Kathleen Wynne didn't win it. But she ended up having the most seats, therefore she formed the government and uh, led to the types of policies that she put in place and the people of Ontario uh, quite rightly are understanding that we're going to be paying and paying and paying and then when we get done our children are going to do it and some of the policies means our, gran our grandchildren are going to be paying. Yeah. People of Ontario I think are more fiscally prudent than that. And uh, again, it was a social experiment that I don't think was successful for liberalism. And so we have to come back. What do the what is the what do the liberals need to do now? Assuming that the, they they hold on that the party holds on to its party status in this election, and I think you think they will. Yeah, I, I think uh, that they are going to have party status, but I think my prediction is based on a bit of love for uh, liberalism. Yeah. I mean, I'm a liberal. I will always be a liberal. I, I have bled liberal from the time I was conceived by my parents who were liberal activists, so to speak, organizers. But we now have to change course. And which course is that? To sort of, re, to sort of slide the party back yeah. more towards the center yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah. So if we want to look after, uh, or we look at everything the day after the election, I would say all right, here's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. One, we have to ask the leader to resign as quickly as possible. That's what I was going to ask. Can, can the party do it with Kathleen Wynne at the helm? I don't think she'll stay, but I mean, that's her decision. The reality is she is the leader and only a leadership convention or her resigning can, uh, can remove her from, from the position as being the head of the Liberal Party. But I think she will. Traditionally, that's what leaders sure. who lose elections do. Yes. And uh, so, but can they do it with her at the helm, or do they need no, a change? No, they they need a change. I mean, there's, I am convinced that we have to have a leader who has deep roots in the Liberal Party. He's got to, or she has to, move the party from where we are perceived now, and that's a far left party. I mean, I was just walking on the street here, and somebody stopped me and said, uh, "So it looks like your party's going to uh, get uh, decimated." in the next election and uh, I said yeah why do you think that is and they said that the two people said it because you guys are farther left than the NDP yeah that's not the way liberalism is supposed to be defined in the province of Ontario yeah. and that's from Joe Lunchpail walking down Elgin Street and, and his observation and the other guy with him shaking their head and they said, you got to be happy. You're not a part of this one. <laughs> and uh, I thanked them yeah. for their comments and ended off by saying, yeah, I'm really happy. I'm not a part of this for one. For sure. I think you have a prediction, a, a seat prediction that maybe I think I'm going to ask you about. Before I do that, though, I want to ask you about deficits. One thing that, that we've seen in this election is that, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any uh, bottom to the bucket of money uh, that these parties are promising. I mean, we're, it, it's deficits all the way down from all three parties. Um, only the, the, only the, uh, the PC are talking about being able to get back to balance. No one else is even talking about that in this, uh, you know, over the course of this term. What do you make of these enormous spending promises that a lot of people would consider, consider them to be um, sort of irresponsible in, in some ways, promising so much money. What do you, what's your take on that? Yeah, first of all, let me deal with the first one that you talked about, the PCs. That, you know, uh, they're talking about returning to balance. I mean, you can talk the talk, but you have to show the people of Ontario the walk to back up the talk. And they're, for whatever reason, not putting forth a costed program. So we can only imagine I do, can only imagine that one, his plan will not return us to balance without a massive shift in the way we define Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see how he's going to do it. 
I mean, I don't like the idea of, of any party leader running for office saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. We may not balance in the first year, we may not balance in the second year, we may not balance in the third year, we may not balance in the fourth year. But that's not what the people of Ontario want. We want a plan. Yeah. Now, uh, Andrea Horvath's plan, the NDP plan, and the Liberal plan is very, very costly. Yeah. And the people of Ontario, uh, honestly, uh, don't want that. In my estimation, I think you know, a deficit, deficit financing is good, but you've got to be able to get yourself out of it. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, I guess the thirst for power has, uh, has clouded the reality of governance. And uh, so I think if everybody took a step back and tried to see if I get there, is it fair for me to foist all this debt yeah. on the people of Ontario? And for me, the answer is no. Uh, uh, you know, going further to what you're saying, you could almost say that this, this uh, next term of government will be an experiment in many ways. You will have the, you know, you'll be electing a party that we haven't elected into government uh, since the night, since the early 90s. Um, and both the Liberals, uh, who you say have tried this sort of left-wing experiment, and the, and the Tories, who have tried this sort of populist experiment with Doug Ford in many ways, um, you know, the, the two main parties are sort of experimenting, leaving a room for the third party to kind of, uh, yeah. you know, shoulder its way in. Is that, a, is, that, is that kind of how you see things in some way? Well, actually, I mean, uh, we have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, of the three who have put, form, put forward platforms, yeah. uh, the one that, uh, that is the least expensive is uh, Andrea's platform, the NDP platform. Mm -hmm. uh, now, she doesn't, she doesn't talk about how she's going to get out of debt. And, uh, but, but you can't talk about everything in depth in a platform. I understand that. I mean, I'm a liberal, so I mean, I'm obviously going to say uh, the liberal pa platform has something for everybody. <laughs> it sure does. And if you wanted a partridge in a pear tree, I'm sure we could probably find a way of putting that in the platform for you. The reality is, I think we've come to a time in Ontario where we have to be straight up, honest, forthright with the people of Ontario and say, listen, there are some things we can afford, there are some things we can't afford. And some of those things are going to hurt. But the reality is, you have to have a balanced platform. And unfortunately, in this, this election, all three parties don't know that there's much balance. Prediction then. What's your seat prediction for, uh, prediction. for June 7th? Prediction. Okay. Let, uh, let us have it. I never thought I would say this in a hundred million years. But I honestly believe, uh, again, just me, my own opinion, okay? Uh, I think the uh, New Democrats are going to form government. I think the PCs are uh, going to be in second place. I think the Liberals are going to be in a distant third. Uh, but because I know so many of the Liberals that uh, are so hardworking and so dedicated, I gave them party status plus a few more, okay? okay? Because uh, uh, I'm thinking where there are close races, and there are liberals, some of them are going to survive uh, the demise of uh, the Liberal Party as it's defined in the province of Ontario going in to the June 7th election. Rick Bartolucci, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Mark. It was great. Thank Have you. Have a good day. You too. Bye bye. Four, three, so as we. One. Welcome back. Well, it's after nine o'clock now, folks. Numbers are starting to roll in. I think we have a few. I don't know if we. I don't think we have any local numbers yet, but I think we have some from across the province, Nick. Yeah, no local numbers coming in for Sudbury and Nickel Belt as of this time, but province-wide uh, results are starting to trickle in. So far, uh, they're at number of seats won or leading. So at this point, it could just be leading because the votes are coming in. As I said, 43 right now for the PCs, 25 for the NDP, and six seats for the Liberals. One seat of note as well for the Green Party at this time. So that's either uh, one or leading. And they're continuing to trickle in, so this is updating very quick, Mark. That's probably Green uh, Green leader Mike uh, Scriner's uh, Exactly, in Guelph. Guelph. Yeah. In Guelph. Okay. And uh, interesting, uh, the Liberal numbers, I mean, they are they need to win a few seats if they want to hold on to party status. Exactly. They need eight seats if they want to hold on to that party status. 
And, uh, you know, it was up in the air and many polls predicting that they may not get to that eight number. A, a number of polls had six, five, four. So it's going to be interesting to see who wins, uh, if any, in mm -hmm. the Liberal Party. It'll be interesting to see if Glenn Tebow is one of those Liberals who holds on to his seat. I mean, uh, you know, in, in the past four years, it's been up and down for Glenn Tebow. He came in, you know, on the by-election scandal. Uh, he was given a tough role as energy minister. He had to eat that Liberal decision to sell off a big chunk of high Hydro One, which proved to be surprisingly unpopular. Well, if you were a liberal, surprisingly unpopular. And uh, you know what? I think no matter what Glenn Tebow did, he did try to bring a, a lot of money in for, for health care, Science North, um, yes. uh, Mailey Drive, a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, he was able to bring some money and secure some money in, Neo Kids. But some of those projects, you don't know what's going to happen to them. Highway 69, who knows what funding is going to be like for that. Yeah. And same with Neo Kids, the Neo Kids Foundation, who knows what's going to be uh, the funding like is going to be for that. And you know what? I think that voters just couldn't get past the trial. And they saw, even though that all the charges were dropped, they were, they were sent out, people just couldn't get past the, the fact that, you know, Kathleen Wynne, in Sudbury at least, Kathleen Wynne went to trial, mm -hmm. and so did Glenn Tebow taking the stand. So I just think that no matter what he did, he was damned because of that, even though there was nothing against him at all. Yeah, interesting. Um, oh, we have uh, some numbers uh, coming in now uh, from the Sudbury riding, it looks like. Yeah, so as of right now, uh, early numbers, NDP leading at this point, 720 votes. The PCs, 427. Liberals right behind the PCs at 371 as well. Not really surprising in a riding like Sudbury that uh, the PC candidate, uh, Troy Crowder, would not be out in front and that the, the NDP would be. I would, I would not be surprised if Glenn Tebow got a good amount of votes. I wouldn't put anything past him. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some people who still do support him in the city, and as we talked about before, uh, it's been a liberal riding for the last you know 20, 25 years. Certainly, uh, you know Sudbury voters uh, and 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 and, uh, and Nickel Belt voters are more inclined to go either uh, n to NDP or liberal if they're when they cast their ballots. Exactly, and that's you know it's going to be interesting to see what happens provincially because if it's a minority or a majority government, what will Sudbury do? Will those parties line up? That, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's always to your benefit uh, as a community to have a, uh, a member of provincial parliament who's a member of the sitting government. Exactly. So, I mean, uh, there, you know, polls predicted a minority for the NDP, min minority for PCs. Today it was, you know, majority PCs. So yeah. it will, only time will tell at the end of the night what actually ends up and then if Sudbury's candidates line up. Yeah. And uh, I think we have a couple more for Nickel Belt as well. Uh, liberals. Wow. Uh, and the PCs trailing in this one, although we're not really surprised, Frangelina uh, looked to be the one who's going to be elected. So NDP out front, 654 votes. The PCs right behind, well, not right behind, 162 <laughs> no. votes. There's that's quite a gap. And 109 <laughs> for the Liberals. There's about 58,000 votes. Uh, estimated votes in the Nickel Belt riding. Excellent. Um, while we are still collect collecting numbers, uh, Darren McDonald sat down actually with uh, with Glenn Tebow uh, last week to talk about, uh, actually sorry, during the campaign rather, to to talk about his record, to talk about some of the the tough go he's had when he uh, when he switched to uh, to become a uh, from a federal NDP member to a provincial liberal member. And I think we're, uh, we're going to go to that clip now. And after that, I think we're going to go see, we're going back out to the street, are we not, Nick? Exactly. We'll go back out to Gia Patil, who uh, was speaking with a lot of the voters and to see what they were interested in this upcoming election and the you know, topics that were top of mind. So as we, you know, this, uh, like the huge election for Sudbury, a huge election for Ontario, very huge election for Mr. Glenn Tebow. Yeah, he came over, uh, as is well known, he left the federal New Democratic Party, mm -hmm. crossed the floor, entered provincial politics. We've all heard, you know, we covered the uh, by-election by scandal from start to finish. Um, there was a lot of um, anger directed at him. Yet, in the three and a half years he's been here, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, look at it, the PET scanner, you know, uh, four million for the uh, soccer dome. Um, money for Science North, big money for Science money. North, you know. Um, they're looking at getting money for the hospital now to deal with the, the budget. It seems whenever there was a, a problem that could be addressed financially, you know, Tebow was able to come through. Yeah, he was. Yet, it, it's amazing to me that he hasn't garnered more support that he has. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a clear sign that he's struggling in this election. Um, 
you know, we were trying to, you know, you're telling me we were trying to arrange coverage for election night and, you know, his part, his campaign uh, staff told us that he's probably not even going to make an appearance. And in fact, what they said was, not only is he not going to be making an appearance, but it's not a media event and uh, they're going to wait for the, for Kathleen Wynne. Uh, basically to shoulder the load on election night to make a make a statement to media which I thought was surprising you know you know whether it's traditional that the candidate uh, the incumbent makes either a victory or a concession speech after an election and the fact that you know at least at this point they're not looking at um, uh, uh, at carting him out to to talk to media to talk to his constituents or his former constituents depending on how the night goes for him Kind of a canary in the coal mine. Some some would some would say. Yeah, I have never seen a, you know a politician who has you know succeeded in you know doing what people asked of him mm -hmm. to receive so little credit for it. Yeah. Um, and you know you do wonder uh, if when he you know it, this is all over, if he'll sit back and wonder if it was worth it. Mm -hmm. You know all the he could still be a successful you know uh, member of parliament in Ottawa. You know a backbencher. Uh, making you know money and loved. I mean, he was beloved. Yeah. Even after he defected, you know, people in the New, New Democratic Party would tell me he's still the best politician in Sudbury. You know, he made a big gamble to cross the, the floor to join an aging government that you know you could argue was already past its best before date. Mm -hmm. um, he was able to you know uh, bring a lot of things to the riding. Maybe that will be a comfort to him. Maybe years from now, when people look back and they'll say, you know, we we're mad at Glenn Tebow at that time, but you know. Uh, Today, Eli was elected in 1967. He served for 20 years. His daughter, Shelley. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> daughter Shelley was first elected in 1987 and served for 20 years. And I have been the MVP for the last 11 years. If you look at this, this is 51 years. This is half of a century where people have chosen shared and prosperity and social justice. They have chosen to vote MVP, and I thank them for that. Parce que ça fait au-dessus de 50 ans que les gens de ma région euh, votent pour les néo-démocrates. Et ça aussi, euh, je vous remercie. J'aimerais dire merci à tous ceux qui ont exercé leur droit de vote et sont allés voter aujourd'hui. Mais bien sûr, un merci encore plus gros à ceux qui ont voté néo-démocrates. I'd like to uh, uh, thank everybody who chose to exercise their right to vote today and make the right decisions to go and vote. And I will say a bigger thank you to those who decided to vote MVP. The, uh, it, it feels good. I would say now the real work begins. The work of making sure that the uh, hallway medicine is done with, that we don't get gouge at the pump anymore, that the, win that the winter maintenance is better done, and that we can bring pharmacare, universal pharmacare, and dental care to everybody who needs it. Bien sûr, si vous avez besoin de moi, uh, que ce soit pour un programme ou un service du gouvernement provincial, je vous garantis qu'on va être là. On peut pas vous garantir les résultats, mais qu'on va travailler très fort pour vous aider, vous, votre famille, votre business, ou uh, n'importe quel autre uh, uh, comité sur lequel uh, vous travaillez fort. J'ai vu Claude Gravel qui était ici. Claude. Euh, merci d'être venu. Euh, Claude était le député fédéral pour Nickel Belt euh, et un de mes bons amis qui a travaillé très fort avec moi. Merci d'être ici ce soir. Claude, c'est bien apprécié. Uh, my last thank you uh, will be for my leader, Andrea Horvath, who put forward a positive campaign, who put forward a platform of hope. Ça, c'est quelque chose que j'apprécie beaucoup. Euh, J'aimerais remercier ma chef, André Horvat, euh, d'avoir fait une campagne positive et de nous avoir euh, donné le choix euh, de, pour le mieux. Euh, merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Miwitch.
Welcome back. Well, those electronic voting machines are, we're really getting our money's worth out of them. This is uh, one of the fastest uh, rollout of, uh, of numbers that I've seen in an election uh, that I've ever covered, actually. I don't think I've seen something go this quickly. Well, it took about five minutes after 9 o'clock and just boom, they started to roll in and uh, already the majority government has been declared in the province for the PCs. So Doug Ford, it looks like, will be the next Premier of Ontario. However, it is a different story here in Sudbury and Nickel Belt as it is an NDP sweep as Frangelina has been declared in Nickel Belt at over 65% of the votes and in Sudbury, Jamie West with over 50% of the votes. And in both ridings, it's NDP, PCs and Liberals at this point. But the interesting thing in Sudbury mm -hmm. is it's very, very close in second between Troy Crowder and Glenn Tebow with less than a percentage point between the two candidates. Wow, that is a razor thin margin. Uh, we, uh, we heard from Franche Elena just a second ago, or well, a few minutes ago, uh, giving, uh, giving her victory uh, speech. Uh, we will be going to uh, Jamie West's uh, election night headquarters down at the Townhouse Tavern here on Elgin Street in just a few minutes. But Nick, I, 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 uh, I, you know, I, the, the polls predicted it. The polls said that, uh, that Doug Ford would, would likely win a majority. I mean, it went back and forth uh, you know, for, for most of the campaign, but this week, most of the polls seemed pretty solid. And yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see as I mean, I mean we wrap up the rest of the night here. But what happens to uh, the NDP leader Andrea Horvath? Obviously, she's they're going to be the uh, opposition official opposition. Mm -hmm. And then what happens with Kathleen Wynne? But here, and then what happens with Sudbury as well, right? With two NDP candidates going up against a PC majority government, mm -hmm. we're going to see how that is, and it's going to be for the next four years. But a majority government for the PCs and the next premier of Ontario is Doug Ford. That's true. And this is, while maybe not good news for Sudbury, this is good news for North Bay. North Bay is, uh, uh, chances are, Vic Fideli, uh, who's a powerhouse down there, in much the same way that, uh, that uh, Rick Bartolucci was Minister of Sudbury, as they called him. Um, it's, there's a very good chance that uh, Vic Fideli is going to become Minister of North Bay. Uh, he's, he has a decent, very, very good chance of being a cabinet minister. He's a powerful politician. Uh, he's an affable guy. And, and you know, you guys mentioned it in one of the videos that we had shown before when Mike Harris uh, was representing North Bay. It was a very different landscape and I think that this might be okay because the northern communities are a lot closer nowadays than they were at that time where it was separate communities. Now with, you know, Phnom mm -hmm. and the, you know, all the mayors kind of getting together, this could actually be an okay thing if, if, you know, Vic Fidelli ends up being a cabinet minister, which we think he will be probably mm -hmm. finance minister. And so it could be a good thing for Northern Ontario. It could be. It, it could also be a really bad <laughs> thing for, for Northern good. Ontario. I mean, uh, Sudbury, under liberal rule for the past 15 years, has, has gotten billions of dollars in, uh, in government funding, uh, thanks to Rick Bartolucci and then thanks to Glenn Tebow. Uh, North Bay, you know, in North Bay didn't, uh, oh, we got another numbers update here in a second, but no Northern, uh, North Bay did not, you know, fare so well under the liberal, liberal government. There may be some bad blood there. And you know what we might end up seeing? You know that money shift from Highway 69 to 17. Who knows? Uh, numbers update provincially, 72 seats for the PCs, 39 NDP, and Liberals right at that eight-seat margin. So they, it looks like if it stays the way it is, they will hold on to their party status. By the skin of their teeth. By the skin of their teeth, exactly. Okay. Uh, I think we're almost ready to go over to Jamie West now. Uh, Jamie West is over at the townhouse, obviously an, an iconic uh, place in Sudbury and an uh, interesting choice for, uh, for his election night uh, party.
Hey, uh, all the uh, volunteers and staff and everybody, please, there's, uh, and, and our, yeah, all our guests from the media, there's lots of food over here at the table. Please grab some snacks, fill up, please, and uh, of course we'll have announcements in a few minutes as to when our new member of provincial parliament will be arriving.
a PC government in Ontario apparently. It's a majority government and it's by a big margin as, as of right now it looks like Doug Ford at 74 seats to the NDP's uh, 37 and then the Liberals holding on with eight seats and then the interesting one Mike Schreiner the leader of the Green Party in Guelph looks like he will win that riding and be the first Green Party uh, MPP in the legislature. That's fairly historical yes. uh, turn of events. Exactly. So Liz Sandals was the MPP for a long time in that riding, did not decide to run. She was for the Liberals, did not decide to run. And Mike Schreiner swooped in there and, I mean, Guelph voted green. Interesting, interesting. Uh, in North Bay, uh, Vic Fideli has, uh, has been declared as, uh, as was expected. However, in, uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, where uh, Tori Ross Romano is uh, actually in the fight of his life, uh, he got the endorsement, interestingly, of the steelworkers, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but he is battling it out uh, with uh, Kennedy McCle no, uh, Michelle McCleave Kennedy uh, for, uh, for his seat. And the battles seem to be between the PCs and the NDP, and that's exactly what's going on in Sault Ste. Marie. So it's going to be interesting to see if Ross Romano can hold on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, here in Sudbury, as we mentioned, Sudbury Nickel Belt, an NDP sweep. It's a majority government in provincially uh, for the PCs, but Jamie West has been declared 48% of the vote around that number. And then in Nickel Belt, Frangelina wins again uh, by a landslide. Now it's up over 65%. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, we're still waiting on uh, Jamie West to come and make uh, his, uh, his victory speech. Uh, last week I spoke with uh, Jim Gordon, former mayor of Sudbury, but also a, uh, a cabinet minister for a time in the Frank Miller, the short-lived uh, Frank Miller government in 1985. Um, very interesting things that uh, Mr. Gordon, who's a lifelong Tory, had to say about the direction his party has taken since Doug Ford uh, was de declared the leader. Um, why don't we go to that video right now and you, you can see for yourself uh, the, the strong words and the strong criticism that Jim Gordon had for Doug Ford. What are the values that, you, that, you s that attracted you to the Conservative Party and the values that you're not seeing under the Doug Ford Conservative Party? Competence. Good judgment. It's a pretty big one. Competence. Honesty. Yeah. Telling the truth. Stating what you're going to do clearly yeah. with all the figures there. But people are still going to vote for that because people today, yeah. many people, not all, but many people today just want to send a message. We're fed up. We want to change. Yeah. And not only that, people today, because of what's happened, not only in Ontario, but worldwide, mm -hmm. people today are looking for somebody to be strong. Yeah. 
Yeah, that strong and leader kind of character. put their fist down on the table and say, we're going to do this. Is that what we need, though? No. What we need is balanced government. Mm -hmm. You need a centrist government. But that's been blown away in country after country. So you see this rise of populism, and you say, well, why would people vote for that? Well, because it's all been, the, the rug's been pulled out from underneath their feet, and they want change, they want a message sent to government. But by changing to parties that are not really telling you the truth yeah. when they run, for example, how many jobs are going to disappear, yeah. they have to disappear. I mean, once they did, these, uh, the Tories decided that they weren't doing the carbon tax, they're not doing cap and trade, where is their money? They don't have any money, so they're going to have to take it out of you. So when you go down to the hospital here, and you see the waiting lines you're going to have in the waiting room as a result of the fact that so many people are cut out. Or what are they going to do, borrow even more money? Yeah. One thing when I look at Doug Ford's brand of populism is he seems to be trying to uh, wear the trappings of a populist without actually being a true populist mm -hmm. in the sense, you know what I mean? Like he sort of says the, the talking points mm -hmm. like Donald Trump and he gets mm -hmm. that comparison to Donald Trump, although I don't know that that's really a fair comparison mm -hmm. because I don't think he's as good at being a populist as Donald Trump is as good at pretending to be a populist. No. But what do you make of that? I mean, why do you think that there's this rise of this desire to have a strong leader? Well, the rise is really there uh, because today, People are not happy with the way things are going mm -hmm. in our society. What they see, is, as I indicated, uh, you know, there's too many variables that they have no control over anymore. Mm -hmm. Like people today are talking about, as an example, well, I'm not going to be able to retire. I'm going to have to work, you know, on for years and years. Like they're talking about the people who we meet down in Florida who work in those stores. I mean, they're all older people, you know, and they're just making, barely making it. Um, they have the problems uh, of, you know, children who spend a lot of money, thousands and thousands of dollars getting an, a, a, an education and they can't get a job. Yeah. You know, uh, this, this business of, uh, and the part-time business is deadly. Deadly, deadly, deadly. Mm -hmm. Institutions that no longer hire people uh, full-time, it's yeah. all part-time. You know, where are the benefits? No benefits. Yeah, so they look like, to government to like try Like everybody, and... I don't care whether, you know, you're a young person, uh, uh, a teenager, 20s, 30s, mm -hmm. uh, middle-aged, uh, an older adult. Right. Nobody feels secure. Okay. And yet they see that there are others in the society who are very secure and they're not paying their freight. We're paying all the freight. Yeah. That's not right. So what do you say to people who, I mean, a lot of people have described this election much as they described the last provincial election as a hold your nose and vote election. Would you describe this as a hold your nose and vote election? Or is, are, are elections more important than that? Well, I think elections are more important than that, but the fact that I see so few lawn signs around in the city tells me that it's like a pox on all your houses. Those of us who vote will go out and vote. We'll do what we have to do. Mm -hmm. But we are not happy with what we see, what we hear, and what we are presented with. What do you think, what, what can we expect for the next four years? What do you think? Well, it depends upon who's doing the governing. Yeah. Uh, if, let's say, if Ford was to be elected, uh, you're going to see uh, a lot of heartache out there for many families. Because remember, when you lose a job today, you lose your job. Yeah. We're not talking about getting another job. In most instances, this is a tragedy, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's that. So I don't particularly like that. But at the same time, I don't like the fact on the other side that they're willing to borrow so much money to achieve certain goals, which are not necessarily dubious goals, but they are goals that can we really afford it right now? Right. You know, we all have wants, but there are things we need, eh? Yeah. Okay? Excellent. Jim Gordon, I appreciate your time. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks very much. <laughs>
All right, so I'm Matt Durden. I'm here at Troy Crowder's election night party. We're at Ristorante Verdicchio. I'm joined by Catherine Muir. She is the president of the PC Riding Association here in Sudbury. So things didn't really fall Troy's way tonight, but we did get a PC majority here in Ontario. Can you give me a little bit of an idea of the temperature of the room? What's the mood? I know these are PC supporters, but these are also supporters of Troy. So what's the general feeling here? Everybody's really happy that we were going for the majority and it's time to clean up this province. But obviously people are upset and that Troy didn't get in. I feel he's the best candidate and uh, we don't think that um, it's going to do best for Sudbury to have a PC government with an NDP representative. Now, so on that note, when you're saying not best for Sudbury, what do you foresee for the next four years? Because as the decisions have come in, we've learned that it is Jamie West who is going to be the MPP for Sudbury here. So how do you see the next four years working out moving forward for Sudbury and Northern Ontario? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that JB takes into account that he's going to be dealing with a, a majority PC government and works with us um, to ensure the best for Sudbury and doesn't fight us. So that's all we can really hope for. Okay, and now we're still waiting on Troy to show up right now. He's expected to be here in a few minutes. He was around the corner the last we heard. He's going to be here. He's going to be delivering a speech right over here at this podium. So, Catherine and I are going to be hanging out here. We're going to be waiting for Troy to come in and be giving his thoughts and his words. He's going to be mingling with the crowd for a little bit, and then I'll be speaking. But for now, we're just going to head back to the studio to Mark and Nick. And for Sudbury.com, I'm Matt Durden. Thanks. Our leader, the next premier of, of Ontario, Andrea Horvath. And this election is really all about what comes next for Ontario, right? Our leader, Ontario's next premier, Doug Ford. I've never seen a, a province unite behind a cause of turning this province around like I've seen this election. The Premier of Ontario and the leader of our party, Kathleen Wynne. You know, this is a very important election. We are literally, as a province, deciding on what the future of this province is going to look like. We've lost tens of thousands of jobs, but there's still lots of improvement to be done. The team that would probably do the best for the province should win. We're a have-not province now. The economy's changing. I mean, Glenn and Brian and Tay know that. Shane knows that. Everyone standing behind me knows that. These are people who live in the North. They know that it's changing. I remember thinking that government didn't care. Uh, I have known Andrea for almost a decade, and, and she was as inspiring then as she is now. Uh, when you think of the pull that this party has had and the fantastic work we've done in that Change for Better platform that, that has absolutely been inspiring and I know has pulled people, you know, millions of people to voting NDP for the first time and that is because of Angie Horvath and her vision. I want to thank my team and, and honestly I, I know I'll forget if I try to name them all but um, so I'm not going to, I'll forget somebody, but I do want to thank my team and, and I'm sure I'll speak to all of you individually, but there was an energy in this campaign. I've worked on campaigns for the last 10 years and I have not seen energy like this and excitement like this in the room and the laughter and the early mornings and the late nights and just the fun we had every single day was a lot of fun, even though it was hard work and it was fantastic. And I especially want to point out the millennials and the youth that we had involved. <laughs> This, this was an exciting campaign, and, and to have the youth get involved and to come back with your friends and keep coming back, and that's an energy and excitement that when you take the NDP that has been in a stronghold here and, and the legacy and, and things that we've learned over the years with people who have been around forever, and you add the youth to that, that's a dynamic that I intend to capitalize on and to build their membership and build this riding to be stronger than we've ever been. And finally, I want to thank all of the voters. I want to thank everybody who took the time to cast the vote, even if it wasn't for me. I think it's so important in democracy that you express what you believe in and what's important to you. 
And obviously, I want to thank the people who did vote for me. And I know there's many people out there who voted NDP for the very first time. And I want to acknowledge them, and I want to know that I'm not taking that for granted, that I intend to work incredibly hard to move things forward. And my commitment to them is I will earn that vote as I work hard, as I show up every day through tenacity and hard work, because nothing beats hard work. And I just want to conclude by thanking everybody who voted NDP because every single vote for the NDP is recognizing that you want government that works for everybody and not just the elite, not just the wealthy, but every single person. Every single vote for the NDP means that you want childcare that's affordable and accessible. It means that you want pharmacare that doesn't stop when you're 25. It means yeah. that dental care yeah. and that we all succeed when we all succeed. Thank you very much. Very excited people at the Townhouse Tavern for Jamie West's uh, victory speech. Exactly. I mean, we can almost hear them from here, and it is Jamie West, Sudbury MPP, and same out in Nickel Belt. I'm sure they're chanting NDP as well as Frangelina is the MPP once again for that riding. It is. And we are still waiting to hear from Troy Crowder. Uh, and, of course, we're still waiting to hear from Glenn Tebow. Let's go to the uh, wonderful world of Facebook as we sure. read a, a couple comments as well. So uh, people found out early that it's going to be a majority government for the PCs in Ontario, and that means Doug Ford is the premier and in Sudbury and Nickel Belt's NDP sweep. So a lot of people, you know, unfortunately, saying, unfortunately, we don't live down south, so we're going to be forgotten even more uh, than when Wynn forgot about us. So there's a pretty strong worded comment. I don't know if you want to. It seems um, like a common theme is screwed. Uh, that seems to be, a, screwed is a common theme, but I, I actually don't agree with the notion that Wynne forgot about Sudbury. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't argue with the numbers. You can't argue with the billions of dollars that uh, Rick Bartolucci, Glenn Tebow, and the Liberal Party brought into Sudbury. I mean, you just can't argue with that. that it's data. It's real. And, you know, another common theme is it might be a long four years for the Sudbury riding, at least. Perhaps mm -hmm. not for North Bay, and we're not sure yet about Sault Ste. Marie, but with two NDP candidates or MPPs in a PC majority government, it may be tough fighting and uh, getting those dollars that we had been seeing, seeing uh, with the Liberal government, you know, big time dollars mm -hmm. for Maley Drive. Uh, what's going to happen with the Ring of Fire? That's going to be interesting to see as well. Uh, Science North and these projects that are still up in the air that we're yeah. not sure if that funding is going to continue. Highway 69 is going to be a huge economic driver. Mm -hmm. Will it continue? We're going to see as, you know, Jamie West cuts his teeth in his first little bit in office to see how he works out. And, yeah. uh, and Frangelina, we know what she's used to. What do you make of the idea that uh, when, 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 uh, when Kathleen Wynne uh, last weekend um, ad, uh, sort of admitted that she was, uh, she was not going to win the election, and, uh, but still encouraged people uh, to, to vote for the Liberals? What did you make of that, uh, Nick? I think that it was an interesting choice, but I think done too early. Okay. I think if she had done it at the beginning of this week, there might have been that symp sympathy, and then we could have gotten over it. It would have been too quick, and then the ele election would have hit. Mm -hmm. But she did it too early, 
and therefore we kept hearing about it, kept hearing about it, that she gave up, gave up, gave up, and people were like, you know, that's it. I'm not going to vote liberal if I was going to vote liberal. Right. So I think that those people who are on the fence maybe still going to hang on to the liberal, liberal party jumped on the NDP or even PCs. It seems probably the PCs because they're at over 74 seats. So I think Possibly. a bit too early uh, for that. An interesting move, too, as well. I thought it was an interesting move. It looks like, if we're looking at the numbers here, that the liberals are still sort of wavering between seven seats and eight seats. Uh, the numbers are still a, a bit fluid at this point. Uh, as we said before, if they don't have those eight, feet, uh, eight seats, eight feet, if they don't have those eight seats, the liberals are going to lose party status. Exactly. And, you know, it's been done before where, you know, that limit for party status was at 12 seats and brought down to eight. So I'm not sure if, you know, the PCs would be kind enough to lower it down to seven or whatever the liberals end up with to get party status. Mm -hmm. So that number is going to be very, very interesting to see if they hold on to party status mm -hmm. and where those seats actually ended up being in. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and just back to Kathleen Wynne and, and this, uh, this strange sort of... Uh, um, statement that she gave uh, where she said you know that she wasn't going to win but vote for us anyway um, you know it, it could be it could be that I, I want to give you a for instance though uh, the for instance that I have would be that perhaps that is a very uh, uh, clear indication of that Kathleen Wynne is having the liberals play the long game in this if she um, asks her supporters to still vote uh, liberal even though she's admitting they won't win she splits the vote it potentially hands the election to the Tories. She's probably betting that Doug Ford is, uh, you know, is going to sort of uh, founder uh, as, a, as an untested uh, provincial politician, an untested party leader, and an untested premier, letting the Liberals ride back in on a white horse potentially in four years uh, as the saviors of Ontario. That, that, that could be your strategy. That was, that was uh, a lot of the talks in that, you know, if NDP ends up winning a majority or minority, that Andrew Horvath could hold on to the province for you know over a decade uh, and and continue to grow as premier. So perhaps her thought uh, is that that you know hand it over to the PCs mm -hmm. and in you know maybe even in three years they call the election early and then boom. Yeah. And, and speaking of the NDP, we we actually also sat down uh, in the last week. I sat down rather with uh, with Floyd Lovren. Um, Floyd Lovren is is now on the 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 uh, the uh, Health Sciences North uh, Board of Directors, but. Uh, Back in the 90s, uh, he was the finance minister under the much maligned uh, Bob Ray government. Floyd Logren obviously doesn't think that the, uh, the bad reputation that Bob Ray's government had was deserved, but he had some very, very interesting uh, things to say about, um, about Bob Ray, about the NDP back in the 90s, and about uh, the NDP under Andrea Horvath. Um, so I think we're going to throw to that interview right now, but just be aware we're still waiting on Glenn Tebow, and we are still waiting on Troy Crowder. So we may have to cut this, with apologies to, uh, to Mr. Logren, we may have to cut this interview a little bit short so that we can go to one of those uh, election night parties and, uh, and a statement from, from one of the candidates. Uh, but right now, uh, we're going to go over to, uh, to my interview with Floyd Lagren. You know, the, the NDP government that, that you were finance minister under, the NDP government under Bob Ray, I mean, the reputation that that, that, that government has continues to dog the party even, even today. I mean, it, you know, the, it, it's, it's something that the NDP seems to have not been able to get out, of, out from underneath of. Um, that reputation, you know, you know, twenty some odd years later, looking back on it, what do you make of of of, uh, of the voters still sort of hanging on that? Yeah, I'm not too sure uh, how many of the voters. I don't know what percentage of the voters uh, really are plugged into that. But you're right; uh, it uh, has hung it hung with us, <laughs> uh, and uh, I think it's it's partly because there's not a good understanding of. Um, no, I'm not suggesting we did everything right, sure. but uh, how desperate the, the economic conditions were at that point. Uh, I mean, for the first time since the Great Depression, uh, when we were government, revenues declined year over year. That's never happened before or since, since, since the Great Depression. So there was really, a, at the same time, uh, deficits became a big issue. Uh, and so we were trapped. Uh, can you imagine a left-wing government uh, coming in with really serious layoffs and cuts and so forth? Yeah. Um, so we were, in a way, trapped. Uh, and uh, we could have gone that route, but I think we would have had just as bad a reputation if we'd done that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I, I think there's, it, it's not particularly realistic to, uh, to compare then uh, with now, mm -hmm. um, because I think the things we did saved a lot of jobs and a lot of services. I know that 
one of the things that we get uh, slagged for is that what we call the social contract. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, that saved between 20 and 40,000 jobs. Uh, and that's worth something. But all you hear about is the downside of that where people, some people, had to take 10 days off without pay, yeah. uh, which is, I think is a small sacrifice to save your job. But anyway, uh, I'm not disagreeing with the fact that we still get reminded of that from time to time. Yeah, the other, I mean, the other parties, uh, you know, they, you know, yeah. I don't think a legislative session goes by without someone, you know, whipping the NDP for Bob Ray. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, Bob Ray uh, has remained a friend of mine. He did uh, cross the floor, of course, but that, that's not unknown in this world. Uh, and uh, he, uh, but he, he's remained a friend of mine, and, and I don't blame him for any of the uh, feelings we had as a government. What do you think has changed between? Um, uh, between then and now, uh, where you see Andrea Horvath and the NDP, you know, battling neck and neck for uh, for uh, you know for this election. I mean, the, you know, the, the the polls are going back and forth. Sometimes Andrea is going to get a majority, and sometimes Doug Ford's going to get a majority, and sometimes one's going to win to the popular vote, and the other one, you know, it's it's the. I mean, they're neck and neck here. What, what's what's changed from? Well, well, one thing I think has changed is the collapse of one of the parties in, in the polls, namely the Liberals, have, uh, and that's obvious that, uh, that that was happening, which meant that the. Uh, uh, that the electorate uh, has a choice that's very stark uh, this time. That wasn't the case uh, back in 1990. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very stark choice between the NDP and the Conservatives under Doug Ford. Uh, I mean, very dramatic uh, <laughs> differences. So that, that has changed. Secondly, uh, there does not seem to be the same concern about deficits uh, today that there was back in, in 1990. And the, um, I mean, I think now the uh, interest payments on the debt are about 12 billion a year. That, yeah. that would do a lot for the hospitals and no the healthcare system. Uh, however, having said that, uh, I think most serious economists would say that having the debt at about 37% of gross domestic product uh, is not a serious uh, issue. Uh, the academic economists say that more than the bank economists do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, so I think things really have changed in that, in that regard uh, because I, I think that uh, uh, Doug Ford uh, has made it uh, easier to vote NDP this time than might otherwise have been the case. That's an interesting perspective because you're right. I mean, there is, you know, this is, uh, we haven't had an election like this in so long where there is no strong center. Right. You know, there's no strong center center party. So like you said, you you the voters are left with the choice. Uh, uh, well, I mean, they could always vote liberal, but again, like you said, the support for the liberal party has just collapsed. So yeah. they have their choice of two extremes, which is a really unusual. I mean, we haven't seen an election like that in quite some time. No, I, I mean, I have problems uh, with some of the policies uh, of the NDP as well, particularly on hydrophile, for example. I, I think it's all three parties are outrageous in uh, this uh, trying to uh, reduce hydro rates uh, by simply moving them from one column to the other column, namely from the, the hydro user to the taxpayer mm -hmm. at large. And I just don't get it. I, I think it's, it's silly. It, it's in the long term, you've got to pay for that, plus the interest on that uh, borrowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that, that, that bothers me. And I think it's not, it's not honest. Uh, and I put all three parties in the same basket in that regard. Yeah. What do you make of, um, are there things about the NDP platform that you do like? Yes, I, I, for example, I like their child care program better than the, uh, than the liberal program, which is more costly than the NDPs. Yeah. Uh, the, ta the tax thing bothers me too, quite frankly, because at this time, to promise an increase in the corporate tax at the time of the U.S. is lowering taxes, the uncertainty around NAFTA, uh, I, if I was uh, advising, which I'm not, uh, I would say think that through carefully about yeah. whether or not you really want to increase corporate taxes at this point in time. Uh, and so there are things like that, that that are bothering me. But I mean, I'll always be a left of center political sure. junkie. Uh, so I would support the NDP, of course. But, uh, uh, but And I don't see much in the conservative program because it's not detailed mm -hmm. and we don't know what to expect there except that uh, there could, it could be difficult uh, yeah. for a lot of people, I believe. 
Do you think that, uh, I, I take it from your comments that you, you kind of think that, or maybe you think, I'm you know, putting words in your mouth maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the sort of reaction of the public to Doug Ford is um, you know, maybe a, a help to Andrea Horvath. Yes, because there's no other, there's no alternative. Yeah. Uh, basically, I'd say that's true. Um, but she's, she's run a vigorous campaign, and, and I think she's grown during this campaign uh, as well. So, uh, but I think, yeah, I think that if, uh, my friends will not like me saying this, but I think that if the Conservatives had elected another person as their leader, mm -hmm. such as Christine Elliott, for example, mm -hmm. that uh, they would be w winning in a walk. Yeah, someone a little more centrist, perhaps. Yes, uh, and I think uh, that Doug Ford, for example, they say that the female vote just is not there for, uh, yeah. for Doug Ford, and, and that that wouldn't have happened if they'd had a, a different leader. But Would nevertheless, you, you take advantage of what, what comes before the hand you're dealt. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that's yeah. what uh, campaigns are all about, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. What did you make? Did you see the news uh, today with, with some pollsters suggesting that Andrea Horvath might actually uh, take a lot of downtown Toronto ridings away from the Liberals? Did you see that? Uh, I, I did not see that. Uh, what's, what's remarkable is that even with uh, an increase in the popular vote, like say it was 40 to 35, whatever, for, for the NDP, that's not a guarantee that they would form the government because of vote splitting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you get a whole bunch of votes out of one riding, um, which increases your percentage of the vote, but in the meantime, the other party is winning three or four seats with small majorities. So uh, it, it means that you can have a, a majority of the vote, but uh, not have a majority of the seats. I assume you would prefer to see an NDP majority over, uh, over a PC, uh, <laughs> uh, a PC one. But uh, what about it in terms of a minority situation? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And I was puzzled by Andrea Horvath dismissing um, working with the Liberals so categorically as she did. I didn't follow that. Uh, now I know that that. Um, Kathleen Wynne, when Andrea has been saying that, um, Kathleen Wynne is very unpopular in the province. So I'm sure she's thinking, well, I don't want to be seen to be working with this most unpopular yeah. uh, politician in the province. But I think uh, that it may come to the fact that, that you have to. I mean, what if it is a, a minority? Yeah. Uh, and it, whether it's a minority conservative, it'll either be a minority conservative or a minority uh, uh, NDP, yeah. if it's a minority. I mean, it could still be a majority uh, yeah. too. But uh, but I think at that point you've you've got to open doors and you've got to talk nice <laughs> to people <laughs> that that you might not otherwise want to. We spoke before we started filming about the statement that uh, that Kathleen Wynne uh, made on the weekend, basically conceding defeat on the one hand, but encouraging voters to <laughs> to still vote Liberal on. Uh, same time. What did you make of that? Did you seen, ever seen anything I, quite like that? I thought I'd seen everything in all my years in uh, political life, but uh, that one blew me away uh, because it, it is her saying, don't vote for me, vote for us, yeah. uh, which is weird. Uh, and I think for if I was a dyed-in-the-wool uh, liberal, yeah. I, I'd really have to th wonder what was going on. Uh, and uh, you, you would normally think that the liberals would be more um, inclined to support the NDP if they weren't, not going, weren't going to vote Liberal, the think. NDP, than the Conservatives. You'd think, ideologically. <laughs> you think, yeah. uh, but uh, she didn't say that. Uh, now, maybe she's assuming, but I think that that's an heroic assumption uh, that, that, that they will uh, go to the NDP rather than to... I, I, I do think that, that more will go to the NDP, of uh, disenfranchised uh, Liberals will go more to the NDP than to the Conservatives. But to what degree? Uh, that's up in the air. I really have no idea. Yeah, well, certainly, I mean, the, the NDP and the Liberals are, especially under, I mean, the yeah. Liberals are much more left-leaning yeah. under Kathleen Wynne than they, than they were under Dalton McGuinty, yes, no uh, for instance. But even then, I mean, the, the priorities of, the, of, the, of yeah. the red and the orange are much more aligned than, Absolutely uh, than they the are. Conservatives. Yes. Yeah. So you, you would think that that will happen. Uh, because I can't imagine uh, uh, very many liberals saying, well, it's a lost cause, but, you know, I'm going to hang in there. Uh, and, and for what? You know, it, it, it could give the, um, the conservatives a majority or a minority. Yeah. One more question for you. 
I want to know about your prediction. You know, what, would you like? Would you care to make a prediction on uh, on what the outcome of uh, tonight's vote will be? Well, I think it'll be a minority government. Okay. And I have great difficulty figuring out uh, who will have the most seats. I really don't know. I mean, I I can make a prediction, uh, but it, it you'd have to figure out whether it's wishful thinking or an honest prediction. Sure. Uh, I, I think it'll be a minority uh, NDP government. Excellent, Floyd Logren. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thanks very much. We are going to go uh, wrap up. So, um, we have uh, heard from uh, Troy Crowder. We're going to be bringing you tape of that momentarily. We're still uh, waiting to hear from Glenn Tebow, uh, who didn't fare so well in this election, but we really want to hear uh, what he has to say. Exactly. And, you know, a majority government for the PCs will wrap it up again. Doug Ford, the Premier of Ontario here in Sudbury in Nickel Belt, NDP sweep. Jamie West, as you just heard from him in his victory speech. Uh, he is the new MPP for Sudbury, and Nickel Belt once again elects Franz Jelena. Yeah, uh, we got a lot of comments coming in on Facebook. And just remember this live, uh, again, I want to remind you this live stream is brought to you by Collège Boreal. Uh, we really appreciate the support that we were able to get uh, to help us do this show and keep you guys entertained. But there's some interesting discussion here going on on Facebook. A lot of people seem to think, well, at least, you know, the, the tenor of this discussion here is that we're going to be losing out. Yeah, the North, it seems like, uh, from the comment section, losing out. Also, uh, a lot in the comment section about, you know, mini Trump and comparing Doug Ford to, to Donald Trump in the United States. And there have been those comparisons throughout the entire election as, you know, we continue to hear more and more from Doug Ford. Ford is certainly a populist. I don't know that uh, that the comparison to Trump is very fair. What do you think? I, I mean, for me, the really only comparison is the you know the orange skin. Is I mean, the spray tan seems to be coming on very strong. But that that's the only comparison that I really have. I think the two are are very different. I mean, they see sort of eye to eye in terms of the business sense. Mm -hmm. I think, but other than that, or, I mean. We're going to have four years of Doug Ford, so mm -hmm. he's going to get his opportunity to grow. This is really new role for him, as it would have been for Andrea Horvath. So it's going to be interesting to see how Doug Ford handles the role and handles uh, the other parties as well and working with them, as mm -hmm. we're going to have two Sudbury NDP uh, MPPs, Nickel Belt and Sudbury. So it's going to be interesting to see how the PCs work with the NDPs there. I'd be very surprised if uh, the NDP and the and the Liberals uh, will, will play nicely in the sandbox with... Uh, with Doug Ford and the Tories, that that uh, that I mean, I'm you know we can be hopeful that that, that that's going to happen. We can be hopeful that uh, a politician of the caliber of uh, Frangelina or um, you know, but a newcomer like West, who is untested. I mean, he's uh, he's an untested politician. Uh, he's never been to Queens Park. He's never tried to you know to wield the influence that politicians need to wield in the background. Um, to get to get people to uh, to you know to come on side to play ball with them. But I think his strength is that he has some great experience dealing with people. And he has experience, you know, as he mentioned in his, his victory speech, with hard work. And that's exactly, I mean, you can't teach hard work. And if he's going to bring anything, anything to uh, Queen's Park, that's going to be a good thing to have on your side. And you know what? And another thing, I mean, the Green Party here in Sudbury and Nickel right. Belt, they did okay um, <laughs> around, you know, I mean, they trail behind in, in fourth place, uh, as usually they do in, mm -hmm. in Sudbury and Nickel Belt, around 3 to 5%, 6% of the votes. Okay. But very interesting enough, and I'm sure they're celebrating, the Green Parties are, as they won a seat in the legislature in Guelph, and the leader, Mike Schreiner, stepped in and took a seat for the Greens. Certainly, I, I mean, as you know, I've been covering elections for quite a number of years now, and um, I remember when the Green Party first started getting, first started sort of making headway in Ontario, or at least having candidates in Ontario, and, and I have to say that the quality of the candidates that they've been able to attract is uh, leaps and bounds better than it was when they first started. 100%. You have uh, highly educated uh, candidates here in Sudbury and Nickel Belt, both uh, work for Laurentian University, so the, they know their stuff, and uh, it was a big topic for you guys, talking about the you know the fringe candidates in one of your interviews. Certainly. Darren and I uh, did, because this election there were, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, six or seven candidates in, in each riding. Um, you know, we had the four main parties, of course, uh, with the, with the, including the Greens in there. Uh, but we also had Libertarians. Uh, we had uh, David Popescu, uh, the perennial independent candidate. Um, we had uh, the two um, from the Consensus Ontario Party, which is a new party this year. Uh, and uh, we also had a couple of Libertarians. And so, I mean, it, it was interesting to see because you mentioned uh, they're a little bit 
you know, even maybe more entertaining than the actual main party candidates. So uh, interesting to see what they bring to the debates every uh, election, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, maybe we'll hear what they brought to the table here in this little feature. Yeah, I spoke with Darren McDonald uh, about the fringe candidates, about these sort of one-note parties and uh, what they stand for, and also what, you know, what it takes for someone to put their name on the ballot uh, to, to stand and, and, and be counted. So we're going to go to a conversation that I had with Darren McDonald uh, a week ago or so. We're talking about cynicism uh, the, uh, among the electorate momentarily. One thing that we saw in this election, election in Sudbury, in both the Sudbury riding and the Nickel Belt riding, was sort of the, the rise of um, some one-note sort of parties, if I can call them that. I'm sure they probably don't appreciate me calling them one-note parties, but really that's what they are. I'm talking about uh, the Libertarians. I'm talking about uh, the None of the Above party. Um, which is a kind of a clum clumsy name. The Northern Ontario Party is very kind of one note in a lot of ways. Um, Consensus Ontario again is another party which uh, you know they seem to be very one note. And how does that play into the cynicism? Do you think? Um, one thing I noticed about the the fringe parties this time around is they seemed obsessed with recall. They seem to think that giving voters a right to recall their politicians in mid-election would be some sort of super popular uh, plan that would resonate with voters. Um, none of the above party candidate, David Silvestri, for example, um, said it was crazy to keep electing people for four years and we should be able to fire them during their term. He actually mentioned it during the, the Chamber of Commerce debate. Okay, let's look at that. You know, a friend of mine told me about democracy back in the Roman days where midterm, the people got to vote on the least popular politician and he was excommunicated from the country so there was an incentive not to be the worst anyway <laughs> and here we have four years where people have we've given them full permission to make every decision that affects our lives without considering what we might think and so I'm looking actually for some accountability within our government that we can initiate if we feel, enough of us feel, is, uh, you know, basically not, maintain, not keeping their promises. And, you know, different parties, same idea. During the Nickel Belt debate, uh, Matt Del Papa of the Northern Ontario Party had almost the exact same message. Democracy isn't something that happens every four years. Democracy happens every day. And the Northern Ontario Party will make you, the people of Nickel Belt, a part of the process. In fact, if elected, we want the public to help us govern. Every major issue will be decided by polling the electorate. I think, you know, the fact that none of them were able to really get any traction this time around yeah. is probably, you know, one uh, reflection of the fact that as much as um, maybe it was more popular in the reform era, you know, under Preston Manning, um, I'm not sure that recall has ever really taken off the way they had hoped as a, uh, an issue. I'm not sure how many voters really see that as a solution. Um, I think a lot of voters, I mean, my opinion is that a lot of voters are say, well, you know, we already have recall, it's called an election. <laughs> yeah, and that appeals to a certain um, strain of voter. Yeah. And I think maybe one of the bigger factors is Patrick Brown isn't the leader of the Tories, it's Doug Ford. And Doug Ford speaks to that vein of voter, you know, the angry, you know, we want politicians to, you know, give us simple answers and do it and, you know, be honest and whatever. And, you know, whereas some of these populist parties seem to think that what people want is to make every decision, it seems more like, um, you know, populism is moving in more in direction of, you know, the single leader who, yeah. trust me, he's going to stand up, he's going to get everything done. And it's almost always a he. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that seems to be resonating. So it really took a lot of the steam out of the French parties. I think the fact that they sounded so much like you know, the Consensus Party, the Northern Ontario Party, the None of the Above Party, yeah. you know, there's not a whole lot to distinguish them. They would probably get very angry to hear that. They probably would, but, but their platforms were not very broad. No, no, they're, they're pretty narrow and you know, they, they sounded a lot alike. Yeah. But still, I mean, I, the, I think I was somewhat heartened by the fact that um, there were so many people who were willing to 
you know, throw their hat in the ring in election, even though, I mean, they, you know, they, they, I'm sure they entered the race with hope, but they, might, they couldn't have had any illusions that they were, you know, literally going to, you know, unseat, uh, you know, a major party that, uh, you know, that has like a fully costed platform, that has broad ideas, that has, you know, a war chest, that has all this sort of infrastructure surrounding it. Yeah, almost always the French candidates are a little bit more interesting than the main candidates. Yeah. Um, <coughs> David Popescu? Well, yeah, because they're not tied to, you know, they can say what they want and no one's going to get all that upset because, yeah, you know. Kind of like where the New Democrats are often, uh, they're sort of often in that position. Right. So um, with the, the French candidates, you tend to get a mix of people like David Popescu who are maybe, uh, you know, running just to get attention, mm -hmm. you know, who just want a platform for whatever ideas they have. Yeah. Then you have other people like, um, you know, Mila Chavez Wong. And uh, Kevin Bro in, in Nickel Belt, mm -hmm. you know, you get the impression with a guy like Bro that, you know, he ran in the uh, municipal election a few years yeah. ago. He's, he's a young fellow, uh, that he's trying to get his name out there. And name recognition is very important because you know, he's looking at a career in politics. Yeah. And you have Mila, who's been around a while, um, has run in several elections, and I think is, was just, you know, was it, uh, attracted to the consensus party. Yeah. Um, and when you are at the debates, when you're you know doing these video interviews, you do uh, have an opportunity to at least get your message out there, mm -hmm. and you know there's some value in that. Yeah. The unique unique thing about the Greens is you would certainly argue that they were alone in this election and that they weren't pandering to voters. Yeah, they may have you know pandered to their base in some ways. You know, for example, uh, plans to close the nuclear plant is you know very important to some Green voters. Yeah. But they were the only party who were promising to end the subsidies for hydro. People don't want to pay more for hydro, so obviously that's not a election promise that's going to get you elected. Yeah. Uh, but you know, good on them. They you know, they came out with a message that was a tough sell, and they stuck to it. And that, for me, at least, that was refreshing. We bring the cost down automatically by converting to a low economy, low carbon economy. Now those are harder ideas, right? It's not I'm going to give you 30 percent free. We're not saying that. We're saying we change the system so it's cheaper. So would consumers see a, 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 an increase in their prices, at least in the short term? They're going to see the real prices. So that's gonna, 20, also, 25 percent increase? No, they're going to see the real prices. They're not going to be lied to. There's a difference between raising the price and hiding the price. They're paying that money out of another pocket. That's a lie. Yeah, although I don't, I'm not sure if consumers are that worried about the terminology so okay, much so as the, what they see in their right, bill, right? right. Yeah. Certainly if you have the conservatives screaming, you can't raise my taxes, this is too much, for political reasons, you end up with a miseducated public. You end up with a public that is not getting the right information and a government that's making wrong decisions. It was, it was refreshing too, I think, in the sense that they, they actually seem to be sticking to their principles as a party, where, you know, where the mainstream parties, you know, they're, they seem to have their, their priorities and their principles, you know, they kind of, they meshed and they, they interwove and they kind of bled into one another in a lot of ways as, they, as the parties jostled for attention. Whereas the Greens, maybe by virtue of the fact that, you know, they, they are, you know, the fourth party, um, they could stick to their principles. Yeah, and they are not necessarily campaigning to get elected so much as to bring some important issues out and uh, have them part of the discussion. And you know, I think they succeed on that level. Whether or not they will ever get to the point where they're you know contending for either a spot in government or mm -hmm. as part of a coalition, you know, it's difficult to say. Yeah. Uh, Ontarians that have to make the environment much more of an issue in their minds, yeah. more than would. But you know, good for them for sticking to their principles. Nine, eight, seven, six. And we're back. Welcome back to uh, Sudbury.com's live stream coverage of Ontario Votes 2018 brought to you by Collège Boreal. I think we have some interesting, uh, there's an interesting discrepancy in voter turnout between what happened in Sudbury and what happened in the provinces. Is that what you're telling me, Nick? It, it is a bit odd as we're down definitely provincially and in Sudbury, right around the normal mark for Nickel Belt. And okay. so in the past years, we've averaged in Sudbury about 50% voter turnout. Now, 80% of the polls have come in in Sudbury, and we're at about 44, 45% voter turnout. And that's where we are as well around in province wide. In Nickel Belt, it's about 50%, and almost all of the uh, polls have been turned in in Nickel Belt. Okay, so I guess I misheard you. We're, we're, pretty, much, yeah. uh, we're pretty much on par with the voter turnout in the rest of the province. 50%, I mean, that, uh, how, do you know how that compares to, to the last election? or to uh, previous elections? That was, so 
The highest we've been was uh, a couple of elections ago, and that was at like 51.9%. So that's around the high mark. The mm -hmm. low mark is around 49%. So we're down quite a bit in terms of voter turnout. And mm -hmm. I think that might have to do with the options that people were, and we saw it in our comment section on Facebook and on Twitter, and you can continue to comment as well, and on YouTube as well, on Sudbury.com, that there was just, you know, a wash of who, I don't know who to vote for, so maybe yeah. I'm not going to vote at all. And yeah. that was, you know, that, that was the thought across the province. So that could lead to the voter turnout being so low. interesting to see what he brings to Ontario with majority government and what we might get here in Sudbury and Nickel Belt. I mean, sometimes you have to be selfish yeah. and think about yourself and what does this mean for Sudbury and Nickel Belt with NDP candidates? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, th that, uh, that campaign tactic that Doug Ford took, which, uh, you know, we can only assume was, uh, was very deliberate on the part of the Tories, uh, was to, to keep it vague, uh, you know, stick to those sort of... Um, populist talking points like you know we're going to go line by line and we're going to make cuts and you know it you know we you know you it's down with the elites and you know we're we're not going to be in the pocket of anyone you know these sort of these sort of you know populist talking points that you know Donald Trump has used them to not to to probably much greater effect than Doug Ford um, but uh, and then you know we you had the 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 NDP promising to to you know that we would have you know five years of deficits and it, we still don't really know it, it, where that six billion in cuts is going to come from in that platform of the PC. Well, they're going to go line by line. Nick. They'll go line by line, and maybe, that might take them four years. They but. they may cut out the rubber duck funds uh, from the <laughs> from the budget, and, and you know it was the NDPs who were kind of lining out. Okay, this is where these cuts are going to come from. But how do you you know this is the NDP party trying to say that Ford's bad, Ford's bad? So we don't know if that's accurate. Yeah. And so where are these cuts going to come from? That's going to be an interesting talking point. And will they continue to go in deficit even with the cuts? Do you think, and now the, the, speaking of the NDP platform, they made a pretty major gaffe in their, in their platform. They, they uh, you know, they had, they had a, an expense calculated as a revenue or revenue calculated as expense. I can't remember which on the fly here. But, um, you know, do you think that had, that had any effect uh, on, the, on the electorate? Or do you think that was just, you know, sort of glossed over, just, you know, taken as what it is, an honest mistake. Uh, an expensive, you know, more than a billion dollar mistake, but still. I, I think that, you know, the NDP did what their platform, or said what they wanted to say with their platform. I think the biggest thing is it was very close to how the Liberals were going, perhaps even more into debt. Mm -hmm. And I think that Ontario wanted change, and that's spoke true with the amount of seats that the PCs got. Mm -hmm. Change was the biggest word and I think that they got the most amount of change with, I mean, 73 seats for the PCs, majority government, yeah. that's change. And, and this change seemed to be a long time coming too. When I spoke with, uh, with Jim Gordon, uh, as you saw earlier, uh, Jim Gordon was saying that he doesn't think uh, in the 2014 election that it was a majority vote for the Liberals. He actually thinks that it was a majority vote against uh, Tim Hudak, who was a leader of the, of the Tories at the time and who made that really strange promise, uh, much like the, you know, the last several elections with the Tories, they make these strange campaign promises that end up, you know, they end up shooting themselves in the foot. And, and that's where Doug Ford did it differently. He almost went the complete opposite and, you know, denied the six billion in cuts that it was going to come from, you know, uh, laying off jobs and continu continuously said, you know, we're going to create jobs, create jobs, create surplus. And uh, we're seeing now as PCs 74 seats, NDP 40, Liberals still sitting at seven. And that's an interesting number because they need eight to continue to have that party status, 81% of the polls in at this time. Yeah, so we're we're very close. Uh, we're very close to having all of those polls reporting. I mean, there's certainly no. Uh, you know, we're going to have a. We have a PC government. Uh, Doug Ford is uh, is the premier elect, and uh, it, it's it's a it's a new day, <laughs> I suppose you could say, tomorrow morning for Ontario. This the sky will be blue tomorrow for sure and as well most of Ontario and in Sudbury it's going to be orange because to uh, Sudbury and Nickel Belt, Jamie West as we had his speech on, Frangelina we had her speech as well. No surprise in Nickel Belt though. 
No, no, it's certainly not a surprise to have uh, that uh, that Frangelina uh, won uh, yet again. I mean, she's uh, she's a popular candidate, or she's a popular MPP. Um, she she works hard. You know, she's visible. Um, there's, it's just very 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 hard to beat her, especially for candidates. Um, you know, and, there, and nothing against uh, the candidates who ran in Nickel no. Belt. Uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, Bill Crumplin, uh, Joanne Cardinal being a PC uh, tie, but uh, the Liberal and Bill Crumplin, the the Green Party uh, member. You know, they uh, they ran you know fairly strong campaigns, but I mean you. You need to you need to get up pretty early, and you need to have some pretty big name recognition to over to get over uh, someone like Fanagelina. One thing that really surprised me uh, how vast of margin it was in Sudbury. I thought it was going to be pretty much down to the wire between the PCs and NDP for the Sudbury riding. Mm -hmm. Do you think perhaps that maybe some of the things that were said uh, from Troy Crowder late in the campaign may have hurt him, or did you you know think maybe NDPs were going that way all the way? Uh, I, I honestly, I, I don't think that Sudbury, you know, is ready to elect a Tory member. Like, I don't, I don't know how much Troy Crowder uh, said uh, lo really affected his campaign locally. And we're, we're referring to, you know, Troy Crowder. You know, he, he got a bit of bad press in the last week. Um, he, he, in an interview with us, he spoke about how um, he thought that uh, there was sort of a. He called it a media shift, but really what he was talking about was uh, sort of a, a media conspiracy in a way um, to uh, to support Andrea Horvath uh, at the expense of uh, of Doug Ford. And he, uh, Darren McDonald, explored that with him a little bit. I, I thought it was a strange sort of tactic to take, um, you know, in the midst of an election campaign to, you know, attack the media. And. You know, that might have scared off a few of the voters, I don't think. I mean, there's a wide margin, as I said, between uh, Jamie West at around 50% of the vote to the PC's Troy Crowder at about 20% here in Sudbury, 25%. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was enough to scare off some of the voters, but it was a bit of an odd tactic to kind of take, especially right near the vo right near election day where you know people are are really tuning in and listening and and making up their minds who they're voting for yeah and the i mean the the fact that uh i think still you know uh the numbers for um for Glenn Tebow and the numbers for Troy Crowder are still fairly close so i mean there there there, there was soft support for both of those candidates by and large Sudbury went for West, and they went for West in a big way. And I think uh, Glenn Tebow was, as you were saying, uh, in third, but still at over 21% of the vote. So I think there was, you saw some support for Glenn Tebow, and yeah. you saw that some of the work that he did over the last three years, three and a half years, kind of paid off for him. And uh, as we see now, the Liberals dropped down to six seats provincially, so that uh, continues to be a very interesting number, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. back to Glenn Tebow. I think that there was still support for him in the community, in yeah. in the voting uh, district of Sudbury, and uh, you know, maybe you mentioned it in one. I think you're sit down with Darren. That 20 years down the line, we might look back at this and say, okay, you know, maybe we'll name uh, you know a facility after him or something after like Glenn that Tebow? after Glenn Tebow. Because I mean. He, he did bring a lot of money to the community. He did. And was a good advocate for Sudbury. He's not going to be the MPP for Sudbury anymore. But No. But he was a talent. I mean, t you know, whatever you, you want to say about, about Glenn Tebow, he's a talented politician. Yeah. You know, he's, he's got the charisma. He's, uh, he's able to, uh, to get people on side. He, uh, you know, he's, he's, just a, he's just a very good, a very talented uh, politician who, you know, was successful in a, in a majority liberal government to bring a lot of money to the city. Yeah, and, and I mean, at, at this point, uh, Sudbury's biggest thing is even though he did get 21%, was the change. And, you know, they, they went NDP, and they went NDP for, well, I guess, not the first time in a while because they did elect, Sudbury did elect an NDP candidate back in, uh, uh, he said, Tebow, Glenn Tebow, 22%, Crowder, 23%. So it's Very even closer cool. than I was yeah. saying. Um, but they'd elected Joe Cimino and then went back to the Liberals. I think that was a lot to do with, you know, having a majority government as well and getting a candidate for the Liberals in there. Yeah. But before that, it was Liberals uh, for, from 95 on. So. Yeah, Liberals all the way down. Mm -hmm. Um, we're still uh, trying to get some tape of, um, of Tory Crowder's uh, acceptance speech. Uh, we're still trying to connect uh, with Glenn Tebow. We're hoping to bring uh, that to you shortly. Um, but uh, we, uh, right now, I think we're, we, we still have some more, uh, some more segments that we haven't shown to you uh, in this live stream event brought to you by College Boreal. And uh, I think uh, we're going to go to maybe Gia Patel back out on the, Gia Patel back out on the street, uh, yeah. Nick? So uh, we sent her out on the street to get kind of, you know, what the issues that were important to you guys uh, here in Sudbury and Nickel Belt. And uh, uh, we'll see if Doug Ford and the majority government can tackle some of those issues and bring some relief to health care here in Sudbury. All right.
Let's go to that streeter right now. Hi, my name is Gia Patel and I'm with Sudbury.com. We're out and about in Sudbury today listening to your concerns and issues that you feel are important to people living in Sudbury. So what are some of the issues that you feel are important here in the North? Uh, well, the North, of course, is a separate entity from the rest of the province, regardless of what they say down south. Well, as a matter of fact, I don't even think they think of us down south. But here we are in the North, and uh, we have our own particular issues and our particular concerns. And uh, really, I'm very, very much concerned about how we're going to pay off the debt. Not personally, of course, but I'm worried about how our, my children and grandchildren are going to look at the debt. And as for seniors, we're really concerned about who's going to be looking after us as we get older. Would you want to end up in, uh, in the hallway at any hospital in the province? And it's uh, you know something with respect to housing too, is that uh, how are we going to be housed going forward into the future? Well, I'm concerned that if the PCs get in, that um, they're going to forget about the little people, the, uh, the more vulnerable people in our society. I remember when Mike Harris was uh, running the government, that's what he did, and a lot of people were, um, uh, were hurt by it, you know? I think it's my main issue is the tax burden that, uh, that people are facing today, that working people face. Uh, I understand that there's need and people need things, but also people have to work to pay for these things. And I don't know, I just, it'd be nice to know exactly where my tax money is going. Yeah, but I think too it's also a function of of maybe what I, I'm more I'm concerned about the uh, resources and some of the different parties talk about distributing the resources yet northern different groups in different areas but Northern Ontario has been talking about that for years getting some of the benefits of the resources from the mines and forestry up here but it doesn't happen so they're talking about it now and they're pretty some of the parties are pretty cavalier with how generous they are to give away all the resources and without I don't know if they've planned a property budget and whatnot. When they start cutting taxes and get things like that as well, then that's, you know, you have to wonder where the money's going to come from. But I'm hoping for a minority government. And this way, at least, not, at least the other party, the two parties will have to sort of not go crazy and they'll keep each other in check. So the two parties will have to come to sort of mutual agreement and compromise. So it looks like uh, we're, as you know, sometimes happens with uh, these uh, these live events. We're having a, a few technical uh, issues connecting to our reporters uh, out in the field. Uh, so we're going to be recording some 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 stuff with uh, Troy Crowder. We're going to be recording some stuff with Glenn Tebow, and we're going to bring those uh, those uh, interviews with to you a little bit later. Um, but right now, I, you know, um, Darren McDonald uh, on his Twitter account, uh, which is uh, at Darren MacD on Twitter, if you want to call, if you want to follow him. He's saying that in, in uh, Tebow, in his acceptance, uh, in his, uh, sorry, his, um, his, his concession speech, uh, Tebow, you know, said uh, that uh, he, this would probably be the last time that uh, Sudbury heard from him for a little while. And yeah, so we'll have those uh, videos up shortly on Sudbury.com in terms of hearing Glenn Tebow's uh, concession speech and the other, the victory speeches as well. So yeah, Glenn Tebow, a little bit emotional at his at his speech, uh, as Darren McDonald was saying, so um, there was, you know, some rumors of what might be next for Glenn Tebow, and it seems like he might be, you know, taking a little break. Okay, uh, and uh, you know, it's been a, a long road. It's been a long uh, few years for Glenn as uh, as a cabinet minister, as an M and as an MPP for Sudbury. So uh, I guess a uh, vacation is what. Uh, so we're looking at some numbers here. We got one poll uh, left uh, in Nickel Belt. We had a six, 56 percent turnout uh, out there. Jelena took 63 percent of the vote. Uh, there are still 15 polls left uh, to report in Sudbury. As we said earlier, 46, 47% voter turnout. Uh, and West, uh, it seems, to, to, uh, took 47% uh, of the vote uh, so far. Uh, and over in the Sioux, as we told you earlier, uh, Ross Romano is in uh, the fight for a, a bit of a f fight for his life. He's got a, uh, he's got a lead. Uh, so it looks like... Uh,
and up in Timmins uh, NDP as well. So For, uh, Gilles Bisson, so close. another longtime NDP uh, MPP. Exactly. So here in Sudbury and Nickel Belt, NDP all the way up in Timmins NDP, and then to the right and left of us. Uh, they go PC. Interesting. Uh, we are going to have uh, more uh, for you to read and more for you to watch on Sudbury.com as, uh, as the night goes on. Uh, but uh, I think we're, we're going to say goodbye to you now uh, from, from the studio. We want to thank you so much for joining us uh, here tonight for this live stream coverage of uh, Ontario Votes 2018, the uh, provincial election brought to you by, uh, by uh, Collège Boreal. I want to thank my uh, co-host here, uh, Nick Liard from KISS 105.3 and uh, 927 Rock for joining me. Oh, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. It went by fast. The votes started trickling in really quick. So on KISS 105.3, uh, we're going to continue to update uh, in terms of, you know, uh, leaders' speeches. We might have some stuff from Doug Ford as well as some of the local candidates. And then, as you said, they're going to be all posted up on uh, Sudbury.com. So you'll be able to watch that stuff late into the night if you want to, you know, have a celebration or perhaps, uh, you know. Or a cry. Or a cry. A, or a cry. So a celebration, cry, it's really up to you. Um, I want to thank you very much for joining us here tonight. I want to thank Nick Liard uh, for joining us. I want to thank all of the uh, crew and uh, reporters here at Sudbury.com that made it possible, especially uh, Heather Green Oliver, who... Uh, who uh, is really, uh, she's the queen of the night. You guys don't see her. Uh, she's our AOK -okay girl. You may have noticed her in her blue coat and her Santa hat uh, around town. Uh, but Heather really is uh, the, the, uh, the person that made this really possible tonight. It's her expertise. So I want to thank Heather Green Oliver in particular for the work that she's done. And I want to thank you for joining, uh, for joining us. So for Sudbury.com, I'm Mark Gentili. Good night. <laughs>